life. It's the life as God has it. There is no death in that life. When you believe the gospel, you are obeying the gospel. By doing so, you are obeying God. Your obedience to the instruction in the meeting is what connects you to the flow of the spirit in the meeting. It's what connects you to the flow of the anointing in the meeting. Your prayer life is the temperature of your Christian life. Your faith must be in the law. The blood of Jesus is something the devil cannot stand. Father, we thank you tonight in the name of Jesus. We open our hearts to receive your word. And we receive all trans in the Holy Ghost tonight. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Let revelation knowledge flow freely. Let the gifts of the Spirit find on him that expression. Let the healing power of Jesus be present here and active. For this we give you thanks. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Can you say louder amen tonight? Amen. All right, give somebody to your left and right say welcome to service. And you may be seated in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. All right, all right. So we're going to continue our teaching that we started last week. And if you were here last week, I'm sure you were blessed. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, these three words came to me a few days ago. I said, I shared it and said them, these words at the pastor's conference yesterday or two days ago. You see, wholeness, health, and healing. Wholeness, health, and healing. Wholeness, health, and healing. Hallelujah. Wholeness is mine. Health is mine. And healing is mine. I am in the wholeness zone. I am in the health zone. And I am in the healing zone. Say it again. Say, I'm in the wholeness zone. I'm in the health zone. And I am in the healing zone. Do you believe that? Say loud amen. Amen. All right. Be seated. God bless you. That's a word from the Lord. And I'll encourage you to take it very seriously. All right. Because our words build our environment. Our words build our environment. They build the environment within which we live. Our words build the environment within which we live. The words you speak ultimately become the atmosphere under which you exist. The words you speak ultimately becomes the atmosphere under which you exist. You know, the Bible says, Thou art taken by the words of your mouth. Did you see? In other words, our words take us captive. If you're going to take somebody captive, you have to put them in a place. So in other words, when you're speaking, your words become a place that cages you as it were. Do you see this? That is, your words become like a place that houses you. And by virtue of that, you know, your house creates limitations. You know, the size of your house determines how much expression you can get. You know, how, how much leg room you have for movement. Do you see? The house you live in also has an atmosphere of its own that also not only affects your physical movement, but it also affects, you know, your soul. You know, so your house will create restrictions both physically, soulishly, and spiritually. Did you see this? So you've got to understand that. You see, thou art snared by the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. So it creates, you see, a house for you. Your words, our words ensnare, take us, take us captive as it were. Now, it's good to be taken captive by good things rather than bad things. It's why sometimes there are people that no matter what you do for them, they always end up in bad situations. Because there is nothing on earth that has more power over your life than your words. Nothing. 
nothing on earth has more power over you than your words. And that's not all there is to it. There is nothing in heaven that has more power over you than your words. Nothing in the heavens have more power over you than your words. Now, I'm going to say one more thing about that. Now, if you've been following my teachings well over the years, what I'm about to say shouldn't start to you, but if you have not, it will start to you. Then when I explain, you will calm down. So listen to this. Your words in your life, where your life is concerned, your words are more powerful than God. Okay? I'll say it again so that you know it wasn't a mistake. Where your own life is concerned, your words carry more power than God himself in your life. God has done everything he needs to do to get you saved. But you can choose to go to hell. The power of God cannot stop you. And it's a matter of your words. The words you choose to say or refuse to say. If you refuse to confess Jesus as Lord, God can't force you to do it. As powerful as he is. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can, with your words, choose death. Whereas God wants you to have life. And God will not be able to help you. Let me even say it this way. And God cannot help you. God cannot help you against your words. He cannot. If your words contradict God, you've rendered God powerless in your life. <laughs> I say it again. If your words contradict God and his will and his plan, then you've succeeded to render God powerless in your life. And you know, this is not a strange thing. The Lord Jesus himself recognized this in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel as well. Let's look at Matthew's gospel at first. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 15, and the sixth verse, he says, And you not honor his father, he's speaking to them about their hypocrisy, or his mother, he said he shall be free. That is, this is what the Pharisees you know, taught for perspective, all right? Let's read the previous verse. From verse 3, we start from verse 3 and read down to 6. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that causes father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, you say he shall be free. Thus, have ye made the commandment of God of non-effect by your tradition? Now, you know, what they've done here doesn't affect me. So it means they, they rendered God's word ineffective only in their own lives. So it's, it's not as if it makes God powerless in reality. It's just that in your reality, God is powerless. When you choose to speak in certain ways and act in certain ways in contrary uh, stance to his word. Did you see that? Now, Mark also records this hypocrisy of these folks, uh, particularly the rebuke that Jesus gave to it in Mark's gospel, the seventh chapter, the 13th verse. 13th verse, it says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Did you see that? And so you see the Lord Jesus rebuking them and in that rebuke he makes it clear to them that listen, you can make choices in your life that will render God's word completely without effect in your life. Now if you render God's word without effect, you've rendered God without effect. God has no power outside his word. Alright? God has no power after his word. That's why when you ask God for anything, that's what God is going to answer with, his word. So if you render the word of God without effect, you render God without effect. 
you read it in the Amplified Classic, Mark's Gospel, 7th chapter, 13th verse, thus you are nullifying and making void and of no effect the authority of the word of God through your tradition, which you in turn hand on, and many things of this kind you're doing. So it means not only can you, do you see, stack up yourself against God's power and his word in your life, you can actually teach it to your children to experience the same. That's why it became a tradition, like the Amplified says, you, you even hand it on. You hand it on. Did you see that? God has given a gift of the Holy Ghost to everyone who believes. But you know, there are those who still believe that speaking in tongues is not of God. I mean, born again people, Christian people. What have they done? As they speak against it, you know what they're doing? They are rendering God powerless in their life in that regard. And God will not force it on them. Are you seeing this now? Yeah. Now, this is what you've got to wake up to with, with respect to all this I'm telling you now is for you to know how powerful your words are. In other words, if your words can stop God in your life, there is nobody your word cannot stop in your life. That's what I'm trying to let you see. That almighty God is restricted by your words in your life. <laughs> I mean, almighty God has I mean, the almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Did you see this? Is limited and restricted in your life by your words. So if God almighty can be restricted in your life by your words, then the devil can be restricted in your life by your words. You can tell the devil how far he can go. You can tell him where not to get to in your life. Come on now. Is somebody waking up to this? <laughs> That's why you see things such as when we say the devil has no say in when and how I leave this earth. It's power that we are releasing. We're making him know this is how far you can go. You have no room. You have no right here. Do you see what I'm saying? Naturally, man created, natural man carries power with his words. But the man in Christ is on a higher pedestal. Let me tell you something about the power of words. You see, there are categories of words where authority is concerned. The level from where a person speaks determines the authority of his words. All right? The level from where a person speaks, that is where you're standing and speaking from, determines the authority, the scope, and jurisdiction of your words. Did you see this? Now, you need to understand that, you know, asevo, 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 asevo. <laughs> asevo. Did you see? You need, you need to understand now that for natural man, that is all men, the basic jurisdiction of authority of man's words, the basic is his own life. <laughs> it's basic. That is, 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 when you talk about fundamental human rights in, in, you know, in human society, you can call this fundamental you know, sovereign rights of mankind. Do you see what I'm saying? Now? That every human being has that jurisdiction. You, you have authority, your words have authority over your own life, whether you're born again or not. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the reason why it is, it is with your own mouth, even without being born again, that you will now choose to be born again. That nobody can force it on you. So that's the basic level. So, but listen now, when you get born again, you have been raised higher than that. Do you see that? And Apostle Paul, in his writing, go to Ephesians, the second chapter, and we're going to see all that, uh, tells us that second level, Ephesians, the second chapter, and, uh, sorry, the fourth chapter, I beg your pardon, Ephesians chapter four, and we're going to read from verse, uh, did I say 4 2, please? It's still the second chapter I was talking about. And we read from verse 1. And you are the quicken, Paul said, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past he walked according to the course of his world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that not walketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature 
the children of wrath, even as others. Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, did you see that in scenes? As done what? Quicken us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Verse 6, let's read together everybody. And has raised us up together and made us do what? Sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So notice now, he said he raised us up. So it means there, there has been an elevation. If they say somewhat, somebody was raised, it means he was somewhere before. And by that rising or raising, he is no longer there, he is stepped up. So now, when a man is in Christ, he has risen in rank where the authority of his words are concerned. And look where he's raised up to. He's raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places. <laughs> Did you see this? Now, you, if you look in your Bible, if you have a King James Bible, the word places there is italicized. And what that means is it's not in the originals. So what it actually means is in the originals, Paul said, he made us sit together in the heavenlies. All right? In the heavenlies. Okay? In Christ Jesus. So, now, if this heavenlies is, a, is an elevation from the realm of natural man, we need to find out how far is it? How high is it? Did you see this? So, to do that, let's back up to the previous chapter, the first chapter of Ephesians. So, let's go, let's go back in the book of Ephesians. And we're going, we're going to look into that prayer that Apostle Paul prayed not once, because he said, I cease not, from verse 16. So it means this was a prayer I kept on praying. Did you see that? Because it's good to pay attention to that. So that's how you know that the Pauline prayers are not prayers you pray once and for all. They are prayers you pray as a lifestyle. Do you see this? So go look at you, verse 16. It says, in verse, let's start from 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not. Did you see that? Cease not. I think I should read to you in the Amplified Classic so you understand. Some modern translations will help you most of the time. And uh, we'll look at some of them. From verse 15, Amplified Classic. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, the people of God. Verse 6, I do not cease. I do not cease to give thanks for you. Making. Did you see making is what tense? Present continuous tense. Making mention of you in my prayers. So he, he's been praying this prayer. So he wanted them to know what he's been praying. It's always good for you to have prayed or started praying for someone before you tell them you are praying. Don't just be telling people you are praying for them. What are you praying? And have you been praying? Don't be declaring intentions to pray. Pray first, then tell us you are praying. Are you getting this? Because a lot of times when you declare the intention to pray, you have made it more difficult to do the actual prayer. Because you've announced for the devil, so he's going to find everything to stop you, to hinder you, to delay that prayer. Do you see that? And not only the devil, your flesh as well. Your flesh doesn't like prayer. So stop declaring intentions of prayer to everybody. Just do it. Put Nike on your prayer life. Just do it. This is what I'm saying now. That when you, when you be, and when, when you've done it the first time, don't talk about it yet. Keep doing it, then start talking about it. Do you understand that? That's what Paul did here. So anyway, let's go on. So he says, uh, uh, I do not cease. Did you see that? Back in King James. So thank, uh, give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, may give unto you. Do you see the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Come on now. You should be able to know this off already. That you may know what is the what? And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, Lord, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrote in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand, never the places. Wait, 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 wait now. So, back to verse 20. So now, let's read slowly. We want to see how far. Because in chapter 2, he told us already that he has made us sit together. So in chapter 1, we want to find out how high is this place he raised us to. So he said, which he wrote in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand 
in the heavenly, again, the place he said again to is also italicized. So it's the same location he's referring to here as he is in chapter 2, in the heavenlies. Did you see that now? So, but notice here in chapter 1, he's telling us how this happened to Christ. But it was in chapter 2, he told us that it happened together, us and him. It's the doctrine of identification. Do you understand that now? Uh, and so, and I always explain this because you see, Paul started his Christian life on a very great note to be able to receive this revelation of identification. Because on the way to Damascus, when he met with the Lord, you know, he was going there, breathing threatenings against the church on his way to get, you know, letters of authorization to throw believers in jail. And the Bible tells us, Acts 9, how that, you know, a, a lights brighter than the noonday. He later explained that in Acts 26 before Agrippa himself. And how, you know, when the light struck him off his horse and then he fell to the ground. And then the Lord Jesus spoke, he, you know, and he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And so he, he wondered because he knew the people he had persecuted. At least he knew uh, in chapter 7 of Acts, he was the one who, you know, the people gathered their clothes and put at his feet when they had to take off their shirt and roll off their sleeves to kill Stephen. This is what I'm saying now. And so at least he knew the people he had thrown to jail. So, but this person is speaking. So, Paul Hagen says, so, who are you, Lord? You know, that words, let me know which prison are you speaking from. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. And the response the Lord gave to him was, I am Jesus Christ whom thou persecutest. Did you see this? And this is his first introduction to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus introduced himself to Paul on the basis of identification. Paul never met Jesus to persecute Jesus. He was persecuting his body, his church. But what Paul did to the saints, Jesus said he did it to me. That was the premise upon which Paul started his Christian life. On the premise of identification. That Jesus would accuse him, as it were, no, not accuse, Jesus would challenge him, did you see, about things he had done to the church. And he challenged Paul as he did it to him, Jesus himself. Did you see what I'm saying now? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. In other words, even this journey you are on right now, to get a letter of authorization to put believers and say, it is me you want to go and get the letter against. So it was very easy for Paul, did you see that now, to flow in that revelation. Are you getting what I'm saying now? And that's why, you see, when you read all the Pauline epistles, they are all premised on identification with Christ. That when he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. You see, when he was raised, we were raised with him. You see, in Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, Paul spoke about that. Buried with him like as unto baptism. And then he says in verse 4, just like Christ was raised, you see, by the glory of the Father, that we also should walk in the newness of life. Did you see? So we're buried together with him, did you see? And raised together with him, and then made to sit together with him. Did you see that? That's identification. Did you see? So just as when Paul was persecuting those saints, Jesus said, you did it to me. Did you see that now? In the same way, what Jesus did, it was us that also did it. That's the way God recorded it, to the credit of our account. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? You see, because if you don't understand the doctrine of identification, you shouldn't be giving thanks and rejoicing in the spirit. You should only be saying congratulations to Jesus. That this is your victory, we congratulate you. So the reason why we don't say congratulations to Jesus, and rather we rejoice as though it's our own, is because it's our own. (laughs) Now, wait. (laughs) Oh, okay, you, you are going to even get it more now. I say, I say, I say, you know, you, you know, you know, you know, if you, for example, I know on Sunday, you know, a couple, you know, they, they just, got, God bless them with a new car. And so I was going to uh, pray over it and dedicate it. And so when I was going to do that, the husband was there, the wife wasn't. So I said to him, no, I'm not going to dedicate your car alone. It's for you and your wife. The two have become one. So I said, you go get your wife. Do you see what I'm saying now? Now, everybody else that was there were there to say congratulations. But the wife didn't say congratulations. Because it's our car. She came to rejoice. You get what I'm saying now? 
Are you getting it? Yeah. Us and Jesus are one. Yeah. So, you understand? So, anybody who doesn't understand identification and is not part of Christ, you should be saying congratulations about the resurrection. <laughs> ah, this thing God has done for you people. Thank God for you people. But that's not our case. Yes, we are rejoicing because it's ours. You get it? You know, that, that's why you notice the Bible tells us in Philippians 3, 3, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit and we take no, and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Did you see that? Have no confidence in the works of the flesh. We rejoice in Christ because we are in Christ. We rejoice about everything he achieved because it's our achievement. Everything he did is ours. That's why rejoicing is key. You know, Reverend Mark Hankins always says this very powerful word statement. He says, joy is heaven's serious business. Joy is heaven's serious business. It's heaven's serious business. Heaven has nothing to cry about. <laughs> heaven has nothing to cry about. Because everything has been done. Everything has been done. He has done all things well. Oh, he has done all things well. All things. Somebody say all things. <laughs> you see that, please. Glory to God. So back in Ephesians 1, so it tells us, therefore, so I just want to read you know, so as we're reading it, that is 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 us we're talking about, verse 20. Which he wrote in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies. 21. So we want to see how far has he raised us. He said, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. So let me show you why Paul describes it this way. You see, because the measurement of how high we've been raised is not measurement of space. It's measurement of rule. All right? It's not measurement of space. It's a measurement of rule. So it's not to say, oh, he has raised us 39,000 feet above sea level. No. No. It's not about, it's not about the, the measurement of space. It's a measurement of rule. That's why he now begins to mention rulers. He begins to mention powers, dominions. Names. And those names there too again is Onoma. That is authorities. So he's measuring rules. So he's measuring for us to understand how high he has raised us. He's showing us the people over whom he has raised us. Did you see that now? And you know what that tells you is that a man who is not in Christ is beneath all these names that he mentioned. Put it back on the screen. Do you see that? So anyone who is not in Christ, therefore, is down below principalities, down beneath power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. <laughs> but for us, he has raised us, therefore, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. What that means, therefore, is that he has given us the highest standing that, that there is and that there will ever be. So if all the governments of the world come together and they combine their jurisdictions and have a one world president, he's still under me. Do you understand that? Come on, is, is this getting clearer to you? So you, you need to be able to understand this now. So when it means, therefore, that if someone were to operate by these demonic powers, their words will carry more weight than a person who is not in Christ. You see, the reason why it's be ignorant for somebody to say there's nothing like jazz. Paul is telling you that's, what, that's where jazz is operating from. And it's above the realm of natural man. 
somebody can carry something using rule, dominion, might, name that is named. And on that authority from that pedestal, he can speak to a natural man and control his destiny. And that's why you know, like I told you, that the authority, that the basic authority of every human being is over his own life. But there are authorities higher than that that can superimpose and control and scatter things. And that's why God didn't leave us at that level. That's so why he raised us above it. <laughs> so it means you cannot just sit down somewhere now one day and something is doing you as if you should remove your shirt and start walking on the road. What, what, are, you, what are you going to do? Okay, you that foul spirit. I am above you. So wherever you came from, you now begin to undress and run mad. <laughs> Are you getting what we're talking about? You know, these are not mere words. This is the word of the living God. <laughs> so it means if somebody stood up and cursed you and chanted incantations and then finish everything and say, this is, this is how it should be for you and whatever, 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 whatever. When you finish, you look at it. Are you done? So everything you said, I multiply it by 10. I send it back to you. <laughs> and go on your own. You return it to him. You see what I'm saying now? So, because it is, it is a lack of understanding that makes a believer to now run into panic. Because of those kind of things. Because you need to know where you are speaking from. These, these are laws. It's not... It's not uh, gimmick. It's law. It's a law. And notice here that it, it, this is not even yet at the realm of a calling. This, this is what is available to all saints. So this is not, he didn't say he has raised apostles far above or raised uh, 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 evangelists or prophets or pastors and teachers. No. Us, believers, all of us. I say, I say, I say. Because I'll show you. Because, because I mentioned callings. I'll, I'll now show you again. Callings is also on another level. So go to Ephesians 4. And see the level from where callings came from. Hallelujah. God be praised forevermore. And, and Apostle Paul writing, he says in verse 8, Wherefore he says, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto what? Unto men. When he did what? Ascended. When he did what? Ascended. You notice it was not when he descended that he gave. It was after he ascended that he gave, he gave men as gifts. But do you know the people he gave these men to as gifts to? To those who were raised together with him. So, now, if those who are raised together with him are raised far above principalities and powers. Do you see what I'm saying now? And then he still said they need some gifts in men to equip them. To assist them. <laughs> it takes a powerful man to protect a powerful man. <laughs> Are you seeing what I'm talking about? Now? It takes a very powerful man to protect a powerful man. Do you see this? Now that's why the aim of spiritual growth is ministry. When you begin to function in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, which is open to all saints, you begin to demonstrate that power on a more concentrated level. That same power that you have, that same authority that you have. And that's basically because, you see, the way the power of God works, it works on the move. You get busy with the assignment, the power will be more concentrate, concentrated. Conk, in other words. Why is it that in the Acts of Apostles, it was those who were actively doing ministry that were recorded to have demonstrated power? It's not because the other saints didn't have power, but it's just the fact that the nature of God's power is once you are busy with his agenda, that power finds unhindered expression, concentrated expression. So what I, I'm just saying in essence is this. Don't just rejoice about the fact that you have been raised. Get busy with the things of God. Your greatest defense against Satan is your busyness with the things of God. 
your commitment to the things of God. Always remember that. Always remember that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So anyway, so you see the different levels where you speak from. So where you're standing to speak from determines what kind of authority you wield. You know, in your house where you rented, you say things there, you determine when you want lights to go out. All right? You know, you can, but that your right, your, your power to turn off the lights is your bulb and everything. But you know, the government can now decide that even your switch and your bulb will not answer to you. Somebody's not getting what I'm saying yet. <laughs> I'm going to just show you a graphic, you know, illustration of the levels of power. Now, in your house, you can go to the switch now and just press it and say, I don't want this bulb on for the night. Uh -huh. When you wake up in the day, you say, I, I, I want it on. But you know, that one is possible only because the government has made sure that power is supplied to your beauty. So they have power to not to make that your switch to not answer you again. Which all of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> that that switch like this, you'll be pressing it. Press it as, as many times as you want. Nothing's going to happen. Because somebody has pressed a higher switch. Yeah. At PHCN. Yeah. At Ikeja Electric. So when you say a natural man that says, I'm a very brilliant man, I went to, to, the, to the best schools in the world. Okay, that's no problem. Be pressing your switch. It's working, I'll be, no problem. One day, one day, eh, one day, eh, just pray that the people who have access to something that controls everything you went to school to read, that they will not tamper with all the things you are reading, that you are, that you are using. And that's why like, you shouldn't stay at that level of, I, I just went to school. You need to rise higher than that. So that you can secure the operations of all the switches in your sitting room. And sometimes that one means you have a generator. <laughs> so that no matter what Nepal has done, your gen is working. And if the gen is working, the switches will work. <laughs> so ask your for me, do you have a gen? <laughs> <laughs> so when you say a person that everything he knows in the natural he has done it but nothing is working he doesn't have a gen he doesn't have a gen the forces of life they've tampered with everything that should make his switches work but he doesn't know the answer to it he's depending only on it. you can't just say so just because you went to the, uh, to, the, to, the to the shop the store to go and buy switches and everything, it doesn't guarantee that you always have lights on. Yes, Those ones are still minimal. Mm. But you know, they are also controlled. Those things too, they are controlled. They have authority of their own. Mm. But their authority is small. Yes, that's why it's not, so, it's not so expensive. That switch, that switch you used to press, you know, maybe just one five, 800, 500. And that's why you can see even from the cost of it, you can already tell how, the limit of how much control it has over things. That there are things that will make work. <laughs> so when somebody is using juju against you too, there are some powers that will make the juju not work. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That the man is carrying the juju like that. Or a robber is pointing the gun. So you shouldn't be afraid of the gun because there is a power that can make the gun not answer. That can even change the direction of the bullet. Because normally when you shoot the bullet, you go straight. But there is a power that can make the bullet go back to the person who is shooting it. Higher. That one is where he has raised us to. When, when science says that womb cannot conceive again. It's a level of authority. It's a level of authority. Because really when the doctor is saying it, he knows what he's saying. And he's saying it from a level of authority. The authority of science. 
what they've found out, they've read and everything they've tested. So they, they are speaking at a level of authority. But there is a higher authority that will say, you know what? Every law that says that we can conceive, they are under a higher law. And that law can tell those other laws that listen now, we override you. So that womb that you have said we never conceive, we now con command it to conceive. So in life, don't ever get to points where you feel just because somebody that has authority on a level has already brought a verdict. Then you now go and say that's the end. That's not the end. Just go to the higher law and use the higher law. That's how life works. No, I go to some place sometimes you see the, you know, the front end staff misbehaving, talking anyhow. And as you say, who, who, who can I speak to that is higher than you? Somebody will tell you that the, 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 this thing is closed, deadline, blah, 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 blah. And it's just the, this thing talking. And then the ogre comes from behind. And I say, hello, how are you? Uh, okay, yes, I am so and so. Oh, sir, okay. Oh, sorry, what did my staff tell you? They said, come here. So, no, don't worry, sir, you come this way. There, there is still something we can do about it. You know, I'm using all these illustrations to let you understand the power of your words. A man in the Bible knew it. He's called the centurion. That's what he knew. That's the point I brought you to around. Because when Jesus saw that understanding in that man, he said, man, I've never seen such great faith, not in the whole of Israel. And the man said, sir, you don't need to come to my house. I am a man under authority. You know, that was the guy who knew levels of authority. And I was saying, he said to him, he said, I said to one, go, he goes. I said to another, come, and he comes. So the guy understood that, look, there are certain things that if the officers under me wants to do it, they have to run by themselves. But if I want to do it, I don't need to move a muscle. I will just speak and tell somebody, go and do it. So there is a level where you are moving physically to get things done. There's a level where your words move things to get it done. So that man understood the level of authority, levels of authority. And Jesus considered it a necessary understanding in your faith life. So to understand authority is a necessity to live the life of faith. In the life of faith. Understanding authority is a necessity for the life of faith. Understanding authority is a necessity for the life of faith. You need to understand authority. You must know how the authority structure, both of the spirit realm especially of the spirit realm, of course, and even in the natural realm, you know, stands. You must understand it. And that's what I've just been sketching in your minds. So I say, I say, I say, I say, I say, you know, I've, I've said some of these things over time and, you know, here and there, and sometimes I say, it, you know, that that's why if you look in your life, there are situations where you prayed about a matter in your life personally, and you find out that if you pray, 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 it looks like things are not changing. You should learn how to escalate. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right? Learn how to escalate. That's why I told you about the anointing and the calling earlier on. Escalate. It's good for you to be surrounded with people who are also actively involved in the things of God. This is what I'm saying. Now, people who are, I told you earlier on, as you are involved in the things of God, the anointing gets more concentrated. So it's part of your safety to be surrounded with people like that. So that if there's a need to escalate, that's where you escalate things to. Some people, instead of escalate, they de-escalate. Something's going on in his life. Rather than, you know, after praying, you don't see more changes, then instead of escalating to other people of faith around you, Try losing authority over your life, they now start talking about it with their friends, their unbeliever friends. And that's not looking for somebody to show just to show a shoulder to cry on. You see, a shoulder to cry on does not change situations, you know. After all, a problem shared is still your problem. It's still your problem. Don't mind us who say a problem shared is half solved. Where? Who solved it? <laughs> it's still your problem. Even if they cry with you. Be sure of it as they are crying with you like this. When they leave you, they, you see, if they have a party, they will go and laugh, play, and you'll be amazed that we'll just finish crying here together. I said, you know that, you see, they just, that one is just solidarity. 
<laughs> Did you see? And I must say this to you. It's very important you learn this as a believer. There are sensitive issues of life that you, you must be careful who you talk to. Because who you talk to will determine whether that thing gets worse or gets solved. Who you talk to will determine whether that, things get, that thing gets solved or gets worse. You've got to be careful about that. Surround yourself with people who are spirit-filled, spirit-led. Don't surround yourself with people who are just so carnally minded over issues. <clears throat> Do you see that? And be very conscious of the structures of spiritual authority in your life. So like I said, you're praying over a matter, so you understand that in the anointing, there is me and there is us. Okay? And the difference between that simply means there are things that when you pray, you are praying over it by yourself, you can deal with it on your own. But there are things that you need to escalate to people of faith around you. It could be your covenant friends. You see, there's something wrong with that. In Acts 4.23, something like that happened. You see, in chapter 3, Peter and John had healed a man who was born lame. Did you see that? So, obviously, you could tell they were functioning in the anointing. And that's the way you ought to be. You can't be a crippled Christian. A crippled Christian is a Christian who doesn't want to do anything by himself. Don't be that kind of Christian. Don't be that kind of Christian. If I, a Christian who is like that will really be helped by superior anointings. Because God needs something to work with in your life. You can't just come to God as a believer and there's nothing. You, don't, you can't pray for yourself. You can't fast. You can't speak word. You just want them to shout, do something. That one, you're not looking for God. You're looking for magic. There are people like that. They don't want to pray concerning their lives. They don't want to confess God's word. They don't want to study God's word. They don't want to fast. They, don't, they just, see, sir, just lay hands. Just do something. Let my life change. See, it's Baba Lao that, that you can go and talk to like that. You can't come to the Lord like that. It's Baba Lao that you go and meet to do that one for you. Lepers came to Jesus. He told them, go and show yourself to the priest. He has done his part. If you will now not move, you will remain like that. Now, that's even at the level of people who are not saved. If you are born again, you must be ready to do something, sir. That's why faith is an action. Yes, so you don't come and say, yeah, there's no, ah, <laughs> I have sound church, I belong to a sound church. There's no, I don't need to know the word like that. I say, that is, hmm, the way that knows the Bible, he cannot be for himself alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for you, man. <laughs> you say, I'll tell you that, that the person has a good teacher is not guaranteed that you pass the exam. It's not guaranteed. You, you have to cooperate with your teacher. Uh -huh. So you must be able to at least pray by yourself. Do you see? But there are times where you, you, you've dealt with something and you're dealing with it. And like I said, Acts chapter 4. These are two guys who had just healed the sick. A notable miracle had been done. Even the Pharisees witness to it that this is a notable miracle and you cannot deny it. But when they were threatened, Peter and John knew that this one we can't handle it alone. Being let go, verse 23, Acts 4, they went to their own company. That one was a us and us battle. This one required an us response. So they all now prayed together. But notice, these two apostles, Peter and John, that went to their own company to pray together, they were people who prayed on their own. Because in chapter 3, it was in the hour of prayer. They were going to pray. So it is impossible to expect to get results when we join you in prayer if you don't pray alone. Do you see what I'm saying now? That's why it's even called praying together. So, but if you are not praying, there, there's no together in the prayer. You are not saved to be a prayer project. The prayer project of the church. So, ministers are not prayer contractors. No. At least I am not. You see that I'm not a prayer contractor. So you must be able to pray. Then we pray together with you. In Romans 8, the Spirit himself, he says, he bears our infirmities. For 
He said, we do not know what we ought to pray for as we ought to. What we should pray for as we ought to. He said, but the Spirit helped our infirmity. And that what helped them is it takes hold together with us. It's like somebody trying to lift something. Then you need somebody to join you to make it possible to lift it. It means if you are not trying to lift anything by yourself, there's nothing to join you to do. Many Christians are still of the illusion that the Holy Ghost will pray for them in space. You see, for prayer to happen, there must be a physical body. There must be a physical body. <laughs> you know, actually over the years, I, I always say this, that, you know, <laughs> Jesus makes intercession, he just pray for you, heaven. Ah, <laughs> oh God, pray. Oh. <laughs> intercession of Christ refers to how his redemptive work that he did once continues to speak for you. Now you say, but dad, you say prayer must have a body. Jesus has a body. Truly, he has a body in heaven. So, but you must understand, prayer must, prayer can only happen with a physical body on earth. Prayers don't come from heaven to earth. Prayers come from earth to heaven. So, just understand those basic things there. You know, I know growing up, I've, I've heard some of the old timers who say, Jesus, badura for more. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he prayed before he left. Yeah. That John 17 lifted up his voice and prayed. Prayer is the business of the saints. Even Revelations, it talks about the, the intercession of the saints that, it, that was poured out like, 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 a, like, a, like an incense. You also see it in the prophets. You see what I'm saying now? But the good news, therefore, is that he doesn't leave us to eat. And how he doesn't leave us to eat is by the spirit he has given to us. So the Holy Ghost is involved in prayer. But he does so in cooperation with you when you pray. So because if, <laughs> if Jesus is praying for me, why should I pray? What's my problem? Uh, can I pray better prayer than Jesus? So if Jesus is ever living to make intercession for me, then I should know I should never pray my life. I will be stupid to pray again. Uh, that Jesus is interceding for me and I'm still praying. That would be pride now. It's unbelief now. <laughs> All I should just do every day, I just wake up and just <sighs> there's no need for good, good morning, Jesus for what? Chibi is praying. Say, Lord, how far with this prayer? I hope you are doing well. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you are getting that. Yes, sir. So, you must be able to do something by yourself. Because if, if God doesn't expect you to do anything, then there's no use of giving you authority. Authority by itself implies that you, are, you have things to do. And if you don't do anything or say anything, authority can never be expressed. You can't express authority in passivity. You're not going to do anything, so they give you authority to be king. So, okay. And then all you want to do is just sit down on the throne and be looking. No. That you have been given authority already suggests you are an active participant in anything that has to do with your life here on earth. You must be active. And your first and your most important activity is to speak words. Is to speak words. Oh, you got to speak, beloved. You got to speak. <laughs> because this is your life that you received in Christ started with words. It's sustained by words. It's expressed by words. To not speak is to put a pause on the expression of life. To not be speaking is to just pause the expression of life. And you're just there in the spirit. Nothing is going on. You're just there. When no words are spoken, there are no activities in the spirit. Nothing is happening. Period. You can be running everywhere you like. Words must be spoken first before actions. And even as you are acting, continue to speak. So you see where you stand now and you see the kind of authority you have. Like I said to you where we started, this is important for your faith. This is important for your faith. So you see, because we're talking about faith and healing this month, I'll let you know this. Therefore, concerning your health, your authority will determine whether you live in health or not. That is, the use of your authority will determine whether or not you live in health. 
The use of your authority will determine whether or not you live in health, whether or not you experience wholeness, healing, and health, whether or not you are living in that wholeness, health, and healing zone. Your authority is going to determine that. And that tells you that as much as there are forces on earth that wants to keep you sick to the glory of God, you already have a higher authority than them to ensure that you are always whole. So it means your health, your wholeness, your healing is not left to chance. It's not a matter of chance. It's not, it's not oh, maybe or maybe not. There, there are no uncertainties to it. You've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. And I'll say this to you tonight. This whole issue of your health, your wholeness, begins in your soul. It begins in your soul. That's why I'm taking time to paint some pictures in your mind. So you understand. It begins in your soul. I told you last week, don't let Satan put his rebellious spirit on you against God's wisdom for your health. So everything I've, I've illustrated to you tonight is to let you know, you see, sometimes you see, the reason why a lot of people suffer from the devil is because they have this, what I like to call, no-fault religion. No-fault religion is that mindset that says, look, whatever happens, it's God that determined it. You know, I mean, even, no matter what you do, if God says it should be like that, it should be like that. If God says it should not be like that, it should not be like that. You know, there are people that have that mentality, especially in this part of the world. If you keep that in your soul, the devil will mess you up in this life. Because that is never true. It has never been, it will never be. God has done too much to ensure that the power to keep you healthy did you see that, has been placed inside you so that your life is not just hit anyhow by the enemy. There is evil in this world, but more real is our dominion. So it's not left to chance. You cannot be held by chance. Healing, therefore, is not by chance. Living in divine health is not by chance. It's by choice. It's by divine choice. And you've got to make that choice. I have made that choice. I'm going to live healthy. Whole. Whole. Sound. Sound. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Nothing stolen. Nothing nothing damaged. (laughs) Glory. Did you see? So it's a matter of authority. And we have it. Come on, say, I have it, I have it, I have it. I have, I have the authority now. Say like we say, I have the authority now. Authority. Hallelujah. All right, sit down, sit down. Glory to God. So therefore, you've got to master your soul in order to master your health. You've got to master your soul in order to master your health. You've got to master your soul in order to master your health. Because like I told you, it all begins in your soul. Apostle John writing said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou be in health and prosper, even as your soul prospereth. I have authority. I have authority. Oh, yes, Lord, I have received. Oh, 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 I have Somebody say, I have it, I have it. We see that glory to God. Hallelujah. It's our reality. You see this? And you've got to let us settle in your spirit because it's a spiritual reality. If you are not under authority, you cannot wield authority. So you watch for your soul by submitting to spiritual authority. And that's a clear instruction by the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 17. You also see in Hebrews 13, 7. And it's good for us to look at that as well. Hebrews 13, 7. The same chapter, just the previous seventh verse. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. 
You know, it is impossible to do verse 7 if you don't do verse 17. Did you see that? I mean, it's probably to do verse 17 rather if you don't do verse 7. Because you need to know when it says remember, that is know who they are. Remember them means identify them. That is call them to mind. Let, your, let there be an acknowledgement. You know, sometimes many Christians don't know who God has set over them. You need to know everybody's place in your life. You know, I shared this at the appointment, pastor's conference yesterday. And I was saying this, very important. You must know who carries the power of the blessing in your life. Not everybody carries the power of the blessing. A friend is not a blesser. A friend can be an encourager, can be a counselor, but a friend is not a blesser. You must know those who carry the power of the blessing in your life and let them be in that place. It's very important. Your spiritual father, your biological father, fathers in the body. Those are people that carry the power of the blessing. And when I say fathers in the body, spiritual father, and all that, I'm not talking about gender only. There are women who by their of God, they've been to fatherhood status. All right? So you must understand that. Know who carries the power of the blessing. It's very key. And that's why he says, remember them which have the rule over you. You must know. Now listen to this. In that order, a father in the body does not carry as much power over your life than the father God has set over you. Are you kissing now? That's why it says, them that have the rule over you in the body of Christ, leadership is local. It's localized. There is no one man of God that is the father of the entire body of Christ. There is nothing like that. Everybody's leadership in the body of Christ is limited to the people God has placed under the man of God. That's why it's impossible for the general overseer of redeemed Christian Church of God to give instructions to Winner's Chapel that everybody there should fast. Are you getting what I'm saying now? The general overseer of, you know, believers love world cannot come to deeper life and say, I declare in deeper life, every one of you from today begin to wear earring and use makeup. He can't do that. Not because he's not a, a called man, not because he's not a man of God, but because that is not his jurisdiction. They are not under him. He has no rule over them there. The person who has a rule over deeper life is the founder of deeper life. The general overseer of deeper life. Is this clear to you? Because many, some Christians don't know who has the rule over them. You go on Facebook or Instagram, somebody say, everybody put Jesus on your DP. Then you, you just carry, you put Jesus on your DP. You are not showing solidarity for the kingdom of God. You are spiritually an illiterate. That's who you are. Because there is nothing under God that puts you under compulsion or obligation to obey that instruction. When people speak, ask, who is he? Now, what the man did, I don't have a problem with it. The people under him should obey him. Are you getting what I'm saying now? I'm not under him. I don't have any reason to obey that instruction. You get what I'm saying? I don't have any reason. So if you did that, well... You know, sometimes you may think those things are harmless, but there's harm in it. And the harm in it is the fact that you are identifying with an authority that God didn't place over you. So it's not harmless. It's not harmless at all. It just simply means you are further training your soul in ignorance. Sometimes it also shows that you are not confident in your knowledge of where God placed you. Because that's the reason why I'm able to do that out of fear. Somebody don't look around and say, I sense that we should all pray and fast for Nigeria for the next 21 days. Who are you? <laughs> say that to your congregation. Yeah. If you're a musician, say it to your band. Yeah. <laughs> don't come to the, you can tell the whole world to be saying. Like, and somebody, I just feel, I like to give people benefit of doubt that when a person says that, well, if he didn't now mention the whole body of Christ, and if he just put it on his post, maybe he's talking to all those who follow him on the platform. You get what I'm saying now? I mean, I mean, all those who follow him on his platform who don't know their left from their right. <laughs> no, it's the truth. Because that I follow you on Instagram does not mean I'm your member. Yes, you know, don't confuse Instagram followership for followership in the body of Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I did plan to say this before. <laughs> but I do have apology. You get what I'm saying? You know, I'm just... Uh, you do apologize for what you say under the influence of the Holy Ghost. There's no this thing about that. 
I know God wanted because I know some of you probably put it. Some of you, if we go to Instagram, we'll see that post there. <laughs> Jesus. It's a good thing, but put it in his right perspective. Did you see this? So it's important for you, like he said, remember those that have the rule over you. And it's very key. Like I told you, you must understand spiritual authority if your faith life will be effective. And it's part of it. You can't flow in authority when you don't even know under what authority you are. You don't even know which authority God placed over you. How do you want to flow in authority? It means you don't even know nothing about the authority that you are wielding at all. I, I, I've said this many times, and I will say it again. As I said it to the pastors during the conference, all right? And I use one of my spiritual sons. He has traveled back now. One of his own sons came with him, one of the pastors of their branches. And I said, you know, the truth is, some of my sons are here. Do you see what I'm saying now? Now, over their churches, I can't give instruction to his members. Don't worry, sit down, sit down. I can't give instruction to his members. They are not under me. It is he that is under me. Do you see what I'm saying now? Yeah. It would be wrong for me to wake up one day now and say, every member of your church, huh? they should, they should, in fact, <laughs> they should wake up 12 a.m. every day and shout hallelujah to the west, shout hallelujah to the east, shout hallelujah to the north, shout hallelujah to the south. You know, if God will tell me to do something stupid, it should come through the right channel. <laughs> You know, because some people just think God likes doing, making us do stupid things. And that's not true. That's not true. The way some people paint God as if he's unreasonable. God is not unreasonable. Are you getting this now? <laughs> as I see the writer of people say, remember those that have you. That is, know them, oh. <laughs> you know, who is your pastor? Know your pastor, oh. I see some Christians now, they're just all over the place. Yeah, yeah my pastor in Lagos. <laughs> then there's my pastor in Abuja. My pastor in Abaka Liki. Ah, demons don't work like that. Because the way God has said is that if your pastor is in Lagos, his anointing covers you anywhere. Are you getting this? Yes, Anywhere you go to, they are not, they are not in coverage. That's how I told you later on. That the distance from where he lifted us from to where he lifted us from is not in space. It's in the layers of the, the powers that he has raised us over. So wherever we are, notwithstanding, he's over all of them. <laughs> Like I said to you again, that's why the Lord Jesus commended that centurion because the man says, Look, just say the word only from where you are. My servant shall be made. Because the man knew this authority is not a matter of space or distance. <laughs> it's a matter of what is under that authority. So I know that if you will say from where you are, it, the, the result will, will, will arrive. The guy will be made whole. So you got to know that. So that's part of the condition of your soul. Submit to spiritual authority. Submit to spiritual authority. That's why somebody can stand up and say, just the same way. You know, you know, Elisha is a very good example of that. He was submitted to spiritual authority. So by the time he had received the mantle, look at what he said. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? So he took the same mantle of Elijah and he smote it. Why was he smiting it that way? Because that's exactly what he saw Elijah doing. That's because he followed, look at it again, Hebrews 13, 7. Whose faith follow? Imitate, in other words. You cannot imitate an authority to whom you are not submitted. Because you cannot imitate what you disdain or dishonor or ignore. And as I will show you another scripture that talks about that, because you need to understand this. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. See again? To know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Then he says in verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Esteem them very highly in love for their work. You see, that esteem itself is like what makes it possible for you to, ad to admire 
to the point where you can really want to observe, you know, how, I want to see the way he's doing what he's doing. I love the way he's doing what he's doing. You don't need to be told. It's obvious when you listen to me that I, I, I have strong admiration for my spiritual parents. I love to, I watch what they're doing. See, if that is missing, you can't really have the same results. Yeah. It's impossible to, to flow in a grace when you don't have any admiration for the person carrying that grace. It's not possible. Ah, it's not possible at all. It's not possible. So admiration is, is an element of honor. It's one of the elements of honor. There must be that. That's why you see Apostle Paul saying, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. So there's that admiration. You, you just, you, it, it, it draws you in. And you're observing everything they're doing. You, you love them, so you love what they're doing, so you want to learn how they're doing it. And then, of course, the grace of God flows into your life to do it. Do you see that? Yes, because you have authority is one thing. You must learn how to use it. Yes, That's why God now places people before you. That's not my teaching tonight, but anytime God allows you to teach on it, I'll teach on it. There are certain things we do in the anointing. It's not because we're trying to just rehearse or copy or, you know, mimic somebody. But because it is the anointing, where it came from, begins to also influence the way you also use it. And then you find yourself doing it the way they did it too. I found myself laying hands sometimes in a certain way. Sometimes flowing the power of God like Brother Hagin. Sometimes flowing the power of God like my father and the Lord, like that. I didn't realize, it's not as I didn't wake up that day and say, this is what I want to do today. No. 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 That they can slap people when he's laying. <laughs> not dirty slap. Oh, uh -huh. he's <laughs> He'll tap your head like that. He'll tap you like that, you know. I found myself doing that. It's not because I woke up and said, today like this, ah, people go, go shop slap. <laughs> and I go, I say, you want, you want, you want to call it? <laughs> no. Oh my! Yeah, we come back and say today they go collect for this church. <laughs> no, he <laughs> said that once you are in that flow, you come into the character of that anointing. Yeah, you come into the character of that anointing. But you cannot come into the character of an anointing you have not observed and admired and desired. <laughs> now that many things are passed into your spirit than what you are conscious of. When you are under administration. Some of them, it is in the day you need it that it will show. That there are times where a boldness rises inside you are wondering, where did I become this bold? When did I become this bold? Do you see what I'm saying? So the fact that <laughs> the fact that some things have not manifested doesn't mean they are not there. The reason for it has just not shown up yet. When the need for it arises, you'll be amazed at the kinds of impartations you have been receiving. <laughs> you know, when Shambach went to be with the Lord, R.W. Shambach, and the, so most of you probably don't even know that name, great evangelist, very great evangelist. He was an apprentice under A.A. Allen. You know, when A.A. Allen went to be with the Lord, he had, he had, these people were crusade people. A.A. Allen had lots of crusades ahead of him, scheduled, but he went to be with the Lord. Now, Shambach used to sing for A. Allen. And he would just sing before he comes to preach and all that miracles will happen. And, you know, the next crusade, after Shambach had gone home, so they were like, so what's going to happen? You know, blah, blah, blah. And they said, they'll go out with the crusade. So, they said, so who's going to preach? And all the board and everything agreed and said, Shambach, you are the one. He said, me? He said, no. He said, I've never preached in my life. Preach what? I don't know what to do. And you know what they told him? They said, we know you know what to do. And they said the reason is because you are the one who sees him the most. Because you are the one closest to him on the podium the most. Yeah. You sing before he comes up. So we, if there's anybody close to it, it's you. So whatever it is you can do, just do it. And he said he held the mic. He found himself doing what he never ever in his life imagined. And of course, the rest is history. He had a miracle ministry all his life. Strange miracles. Strange miracles, sir. But all those years, something was entering him he didn't know. Because there was admiration. <laughs> I read a book by a man, you know, 
uh, Mike Franson is his name. I believe he's still alive. He's a, an evangelist as well. And this man, American, you know, it was supposed to be a protocol to drive Archbishop in Tulsa when Archbishop went to preach for uh, a church in Tulsa many years ago. And then Archbishop just saw him and said, you, you are following me to Benin. That's what Archbishop used to do. I heard Dr. Crefford say in one message, he said, you know, the first time he met Abishaw, Abishaw looked at him and said, you, you are coming to Benin. He said, he looked at him and said, oh, no, no. Who are you? <laughs> how, do you how do you, what do you mean? Who are you that I should come to Benin? He said, but well, before I knew what was happening, I was in Benin. <laughs> Very authoritative man. You know what I'm saying? And this man said, Abishaw, you come to Benin, and he went. And he said he was with him for almost three months. He said, I wake up in the morning. He said he had no conversation with me once. Just follow him everywhere. No discussion, nothing. Other than, hello, how are you? Mike, have you had breakfast? Have you had lunch? Have you had dinner? Good night. That's all. <laughs> and then they go everywhere, go everywhere, go for crusade. You will just follow him everywhere. He said, by almost the third month, Sabisha called him and said, it's time for you to go back to your country. And he said, kneel down. He said, everything you saw me doing, go and do it now. They laid hands on him. That, that book I read, where the man wrote it, this man, at this time I read that book, this was 2006, I believe. Miracles. Pictures of all kinds of crutches all over the world. And he said that was how it started for him. Almost three months of just following up and down and watching. So because he submitted to that authority, he could use that authority. Did you see this? You know, that was a strange instruction. A black man telling the white man, follow me to my country. And he did. Are you getting this? Yes, it's a training for your soul. It's a training for your soul. Because that your soul is where the devil wants to mess up so that you don't wield authority in Christ. The authority is there already. But many don't use it. They can't even see it in manifestation because the soul is in the wrong condition. So we're looking at how to put to watch your soul, number one, to submit to the word, number two, submit to spiritual authority, number three, with the armor of God, very quickly, with the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11, Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, and so you understand, you need an armor, because there is a war against you, there are things that are, that war against the soul of man, 1 Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul. Did you see that? So there are things warring against your soul. So if something is fighting or someone is fighting, you, you need to cover. You need to defend yourself. You need an armor. And Paul listed in Ephesians 6, from verse 13 to 18, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fairy darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. You see, the helmet of salvation appears in about three other places. I'll show you now. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, now, notice now, praying always is part of your armor. Many times people read it in isolation. It's not isolated. Praying always is part of your armor. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching the altar with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And as I told you earlier on, the more active you are in the walk, the more you see, the more consecrated the power. Praying always for others is a defense. I said again, praying always for others is a defense for the believer. You can't be praying all, those, all these personal, selfish prayers all the time and expect to be a champion for God on the earth. You've got to pray for other people. Pray for other people. The best form of defense is attack. Be offensive against Satan on behalf of other saints. Satan is attracted to weakness. So the person who is always, like I told you, don't, you can't be a prayer project. Get on the offensive. Pray for other people. But notice he mentions the helmet of salvation. You see it in Isaiah 59, 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. You see, like I told you over time, 
Isaiah the prophet was regarded by many commentators as an eagle-eyed prophet because he saw too many things with exactitude from the Old Testament times. Notice Isaiah is speaking and say, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate. That's the exact description Paul gives in Ephesians 6. The breastplate of what? Righteousness. He says, and a helmet of salvation on his head. This is Isaiah. Did you see this? And then you see in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, Apostle Paul speaking, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of what? Salvation. The hope of salvation. And that, that is a encapsulated statement there. The hope of salvation, hope is confident expectation. Do you see that? There is a salvation we are still expecting. That's the redemption of our bodies. But that is premised on the one we already have, which is the salvation of our spirits. Do you understand that now? The one who is not yet saved in Christ cannot expect salvation of his body at the, re at the return of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that now? That's, it's a helmet. Do you see what I'm saying? And you see, your mind is in this, your head. So your mind truly has to be renewed after the reality of your salvation, your redemption in Christ. You wear it, you keep it there. There must be a constant consciousness of the fact that you are a new creation. Are you getting this? Apostle Peter says something similar, 1 Peter 4, 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Did you see this? I'll read other translations very quickly. Amplified says, that's 1 Peter 4, 1. So, since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, for you, arm yourselves with the same thought and purpose, patiently to suffer rather than to fail to please God. For whoever has suffered in the flesh, having the mind of Christ, is done with intentional sin, has stopped pleasing himself and the world, and pleases God. The, the Passion Translation, since Christ, though innocent, suffered in his flesh for you, now you also must be a prepared soldier, having the same mindset. Did you see this? Phillips Translation, J.B. Phillips, since Christ had to suffer physically for you, you must fortify yourselves with the same inner attitude. So there's, there's a condition your mind must be in. You have ceased from sin. Are you getting this now? Yes, Are you getting this now? Yes, Arm yourselves likewise. You know, in Paul's writing to the Romans, he uses this phrase, reckon yourselves. It's, it's an accounting term. That is, take it into account. Take it into account. In other words, in all your estimations, factor this into it. Christ died for you already. Factor that already. Put it in your consideration. I have been redeemed. Put it into consideration. Jesus died for me. <laughs> Consider that. <laughs> Did you see that? You must. There are some things if your soul does not consider them, you cannot live in the reality of who you are. Consider. Put it into consideration all the time. Christ has suffered in the flesh. Christ died for my sins. And what followed his suffering is glory. And now we are in that glory zone. So I'm not a slave to sin. Therefore, I'm not a slave to the consequences of sin. <laughs> are you seeing it? Yeah. So consider that Christ has died. Glory has come. Did you see this? So I'm not a slave to sin. So I am not under any obligation to obey sin at all. I have no obligation to the lust of the flesh. None whatsoever. <laughs> Do you believe? The message translation says, since Jesus went through, so you may stand, you are closing. Since Jesus went through everything you are going through and more, learn to think like him. I'm just trying to show you the meaning of that. Arm yourselves, likewise, with the same mind. It's about your mindset, the condition of your soul. Adjust, adjust. A lot has changed. Sorry, everything has changed. <laughs> everything. One more point. Watch over your soul by renewing it. Watch over your soul by renewing it. 
Your soul needs to be renewed from sickness and disease. I told you last week, some people have this funny mindset, like, it's all right if you're sick. No, it's not. That's not the original plan. It's not all right to be sick. It's not all right to be sick. What is normal is for you to be healthy. What is normal is for you to be whole. So say it again. Say, I'm in the wholeness, the health, and the healing zone. You, you, know, you know why the healing part is also necessary? The healing part is necessary because by reason of aging and, you know, growing older, some parts of your body naturally begin to get weaker. So, but the healing zone will keep restoring. He said, it, it satisfies my mouth with good things. Therefore, my youth is renewed like the eagles. That renewal of my youth is healing. It's healing. That's healing. That's healing. That's what I keep saying. Sometimes, you know, the problem I've found over the years is that sometimes when you want to teach on healing, some Christians don't pay attention to you because they say they think it's only those who are sick who need it. Actually, it is when you are not sick that you need to hear about it. And that you realize that it is not even those who are sick alone that need healing. You need healing because you are in this falling world. And because your body is subject to decay naturally. You see what I'm saying? And so, there should be an ongoing work of God's healing power in your body. So that as, as the natural course of life is trying to take over and take his, run its course in your body, the healing power of God is doing is replenishing. Because if I, they tell you naturally, when you start getting close to 50, when people, not you, start getting close to 50, your eyes, all right, get weaker. People's eyes get weaker. It's a natural order. It's not even about hereditary now. No. It, there's a natural order like that. And that's why, that's why the, you see, nature is subject to decay, to corruption. Things spoil. After all, that's the reason why as you are growing older, if your style is coming too, you will get to the point where you now say this, the face is not as fresh and young. You get what I'm saying now? Ah. You know why? Because there's, a, there's an aging process. But you can slow it down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the way to slow it down is that as those natural things are de, you know, dilapidating, the healing power of God can be putting it back in shape. Putting it back in shape. Putting it back in shape. Now this doesn't mean that you will not eventually still grow, but you can slow it down so much. And that's why they will say, you are 80, but you look 40. That's me. That's me. How about that? <laughs> are you getting what I'm saying? Uh, when you're clocking 60, you know, you, you take your pictures, go to a photo shoot, and then you're standing with your granddaughter. And they, they are like, is that your sister? And you're like, and you're like, well, glory to God, I'm grandma. She's my granddaughter. Can you imagine that? And, and you know, because at that point, it will be obvious to everybody that you are not aging by the natural order. Yes, 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 yes. A higher law yes, yes. is working. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's why you say, there's a song Brother Keith sang. It's working, it's working. God's healing power is working. It's working, it's working. God's healing power is working. It's working, it's working. It's working night and day. He's working in my body. He drives sickness away. <laughs> you know, I'm initiating you. Don't worry. <laughs> you see, this should be the 20... I mean, okay, that was 20 years. She was 17th or 18th year I've been singing these songs. That's what I'm saying. It's right. It's in my spirit. It's in my... <laughs> you know, sometimes the only good job we bring is like a CD is inside your spirit. You don't bring out track two. <laughs> that's why I'm telling you don't, don't, don't occupy your memory space with worldly songs you don't have space for all that nonsense these are the things you should put in your spirit put them in your soul he's working night and day he's working in my body it drives sickness away you know sometimes you can just lie down before you go to bed and you are just singing it it's working, it's working. God's healing power is working. 
is working, is working. God's healing power is working. It's working, it's working. That's it. It's working night and day. It's working in my body. In my sickness. It's working now. It's working. It's working. Hey, God's healing power is working. It's working, it's working. It's healing power is working. It's working, it's working. It's working night and day. It's working in my body. It's my sickness. One more time. Oh, yes, it's working. He's working, God's healing power is working. He's working, he's working. God's healing power is working. He's working, he's working. Working out and then that's what we're doing now. Getting up, running, semi Oh, he's working, he's working. God's healing power is working. He's working, he's working. God's healing power is working. He's working, working night and day. He's working in my body. For the last time, he's working now. He's working, he's working. He's healing power is working. He's working, he's working. God's healing power is working. He's working, he's working. Working night and day. He's working in my body. The tragic test of me. <laughs> is he walking in you now? You know, you know, Ephesians 3 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly and far above all that which we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Listen to me. Sometimes when people are sick, yeah. And um, on few occasions where I've had to minister to some people where they were in very critical conditions, one of the things the Lord has permitted me to let them know, and I'll just share with you, is the fact that, you see, when a person is under a serious sickness, the reason why the sickness is so serious is because the sickness has invaded their body and the sickness is working even when they are sleeping. It's working. And usually in such situations, we deliberately put them under a condition where the word is working to counter the work of the sickness. Sometimes many people don't realize this. So you see a person is battling with the sickness and he still has time to watch movies. He doesn't realize that the sickness is not taking breaks. It's working. It's working all the time. Working all the time. Even when he's asleep, that sickness is still working. So that's the reason why they say he woke up worse. What happened? While he was asleep, the sickness was at work. And you guys know that last time when people are in that condition, I tell them, keep the healing scriptures playing, even in your sleep. So that when you're unconscious and the sickness wants to attack your body, the power of God will counter it. That's why I tell people, you get healing scriptures, post it all over the world. Every time you wake up, let it be the first thing you see. Anywhere you turn, keep seeing the healing this, and then play the word. Put it in your ears, 247. So that you see, you are countering that thing. You don't want the devil to get ahead of you. That's why sometimes I tell people when you're battling something serious in your health like that, shut everything out and go and deal with that thing. Some people sometimes have to travel far away from everybody, but never do that without pastoral supervision. Because some people travel away and you just die. Because it's usually a, a fierce battle. All right? I've seen people where the battle is so fierce, it's so fierce that it's just the devil trying to get the person to just say the wrong things and wipe him out. And I thought battles, our own work is just to make sure, just don't say the wrong thing. Just hang in there. Just hang in there. Don't give up. Just hang in there. So I almost want to make people, promise me you won't say the wrong thing. Promise me you won't say, he just don't say anything wrong now. Even if you feel so bad, keep speaking the word. I choose life. I choose life. <laughs> oh, yeah. My God. I will show the devil prepare in this life. I'm telling you. Ah <laughs> yeah 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 ah yeah. Did you see? Yeah. And that's why you've got to always be conscious of it that the power of God is at work in me. And, and see the way the power of God works in us. He said exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or imagine. Upa ek perisos. Ah Upa ek perisos. I like that one because I like the because I understand what you said. There's a way that is Upa. Perisos. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
more, much more, infinitely more. So it means that the, the, the power of sickness doesn't even come close to the power that works within us. And so our own duty is just to let that power work. Just let that, that power work. Let that power work. So at a level of authority, you've gone for medical checkup. They've tested you. They say the blood pressure is rising. They've spoken with authority, but it's at a level. Step to your own level. I speak to the blood pressure. I command you to normalize. I command you to come back to normal. You speak to your kidneys. You speak to your liver. So I'll give you five minutes tonight as we close. Speak to your body. You don't need to have liver problem to speak to your liver. I told you, that natural order of aging, release power to reverse it. Yeah. Oh, release the power of God. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. I didn't say pray. Declare the word. Speak to your body. Speak to your body. Don't pray. Speak. Command it. Speak to your bones. My bones are strengthened. Not one of my bones is broken. I speak to my eyes. The healing power of Jesus brings refreshing and renewing to my eyes. I speak to my head. No aches. I speak to my bloodstream. The healing power of God is working in my bloodstream. My heart functions perfectly. My blood flows perfectly. My liver, my kidney, all my vital organs receive fresh touch of renewal, renewal, rejuvenation. My body functions perfectly to the perfection that God created it to function. I forbid any malfunction from coming upon my body. I forbid any malfunction from coming upon my body. I forbid any malfunction from coming upon this body. Oh, yes. If you were born with any sickness in your body, speak to it. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. 
speak to that sickness. Tell it to leave your body alone. Tell it to leave your body alone. Cause that fibroid. Cause that fibroid. I join faith with you. Anyone with fibroid in your body, online on ground, I join faith with you now. I cause that fibroid to vanish, disappear, leave their body. Oh, yeah, speak, beloved, speak. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, I cast that pile, I cast that pile, I command it to dry up, let it dry up from your body now, let it dry up and never come back again. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Begin to give God thanks now. Begin to give Him thanks. Let your voice go louder when you're thanking Him. Thank you, Lord. You've taken away our sicknesses. You've taken away our iniquities. You've taken away our iniquities. You've taken away our sicknesses. We give you praise. We give you glory, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.